I was uh, busy in my room for the last half hour trying to change the first slide to a good afternoon we, uh, after uh, Rick Plotnick's uh, speech this morning. But, uh, uh, he did punch me a couple times uh, during his presentation, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned your name, Rick, if you're here. Uh, by the way, uh, Mandy, if you're still in the room, I want you to know that right now, 12.30, in Ontario at Baden Arena, my 34 year old, 34 girls, four, five, and six, are now heading onto the ice, okay, for their fourth session this year. And I am their head instructor, and I had to take the transgender last week in order to qualify. And this week they said I couldn't go back on because my police check wasn't good. And so I have get to get another police check done this week, but I'll be back with my girls next week. And uh, it's great moving from coaching in the Spangler Cup uh, to working with the four, five, six girls. It's just fantastic. Aces and deuces will bring you riches. Avoid those eights or you lose your britches on Kutchucks. And here's the host of Kutchucks, Jim Curry. Thanks, Marky. All right, Gina, Marky's dealing out two brand new decks of cards, and here comes a new challenger on Kutchucks. Don McKean. Hello, Don, welcome. Thanks to have you here. Won't you tell us something about yourself, sir? Yes, my name is Don McKee. I am from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. I'm a physical education consultant and a junior A hockey coach. I am married and have two little children, a daughter four and a son two. I'm delighted to have you here from Kitchener. That's one of my favorites. I know some, so many nice people there. I had the good fortune on a number of occasions to host the Kitchener uh, Waterloo Oktoberfest. Great time. Oh, boy. It's very <laughs> difficult to get out of town sober with that, Don. <laughs> nice is. to have you here. Thank you. You cut the cards? Yes, I did. And here we go. Starting the best two out of three with a question to Gina. Now, Gina, we asked 100 people, did one of the networks cancel your favorite TV? I hate to hear that. I wanted to show you that clip to tell you, honestly, when you're sitting there, if you want to spend 45 years in the game of hockey, you're going to look like this, okay, <laughs> 45 years later. And hockey is totally responsible for the way I look right now. And uh, it is uh, something that uh, you will have to live with. A few of you are a little short on hair on top, okay, but you will feel the whiteness coming on. My wife said to me 25 years ago, read this book by Michael Smith, Life After Hockey. She said, surely when you retire from education, okay, we will find that there is life after hockey. I can tell you Michael Smith had a person write in his book, the very first page, a poem for you and I. It says, the circle. All my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. Moon rose through the nighttime till the daybreak comes round. All my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Seasons spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. That's what you and I live in. One season is followed by another season, is followed by another season, and we never get to the point that there's an end. And sometimes we actually feel that we're spinning. We're actually spinning in the event. My wife has found out there is no life after hockey. <laughs> I lost two buddies at Christmas time this year. One was a manager for four years with being a junior TB team. The other one, a name that's recognized across Canada, Ron Smith, who was a coach with the Leafs, a coach with Vancouver, the New York Rangers, et cetera. And neither of those guys could quit hockey. And I can hate to say, but today, neither one of them are with us because of tragedies in, uh, in their life. My mother, my dad, lived in Toronto. I was born in the 40s. And my mother could not work because she was a registered nurse. And she was a fantastic skater. When I was three years old, she bought me my first jersey. Look at that jersey. Isn't that a piece of art? I have something that none of the rest of you have. Right in the middle, the guy who's won the most Stanley Cup ever in the history of the game, Andre Pocket Richard, has signed my sweater 
okay, that when I was being uh, presented with an award. I'm sure that my mother read this, the book, The Hockey Sweater, because it came out at the same time in the 40s, and if she hadn't read that book, I most likely would have got a leaf sweater, but she read the book <laughs> and she gave me a Montreal Canadian sweater. My poor brother was born three years later, and he got the leaf sweater. And he actually has sucked in hockey ever since, okay? <laughs> uh, so the poor guy, the poor guy uh, all over a book and me getting the, the sweater. I can tell you that one of the, the greatest memories of my life was skating, okay, with my mother in carnivals because we moved from Toronto in the 50s to a farm community because that's where my dad wanted to open a general store. And I can remember skating with my mother when I was a teenager and winning the best skating couple at all of the carnivals throughout all of the different small rinks. John Bellevue was my favorite hockey player. By far my favorite hockey player because he was captain of the Canadians and he was class. But we had one thing in common and one thing that we did was very much different. Both John Bellevue and myself never got to play junior hockey. John Bellevue went from his minor hockey to senior hockey to the Montreal Canadiens. Unfortunately for me, or fortunately me, and I say fortunately, my dad came from a family of seven boys on a farm and he was the only one that got a high school education. I had chances to go and play junior hockey and he would not let me leave until I finished my high school education. I stumbled. I can tell you I took two years in grade 13 mainly because I was too focused on football and hockey and where I was going to go. But today it was the greatest thing that happened to me because I most likely would never have made it okay a career in hockey and I made a great career in education. Today this, I thank my dad for that suggestion. Before I came from Ontario, by the way, Ontario is very proud to be invited to Manitoba and thank you for that. And as Peter will know, my son's the executive director of, of hockey in Ontario, like uh, Peter is in Manitoba. And he comes home with all his Peter stories and tells me about them after they uh, have their meetings. So he said, take out a load of great soil and much fertilizer. And he says, use the word fertilizer, please don't use any other word. And tell them that this is what you need to grow. You need quality soil, you need fertilized soil, and if we mix that with the administrators in this room today, I can tell you what we're gonna do. We are going to have growth in your game. And that's what you wanna leave here with at the end of this day, is you're gonna, how your game is gonna grow. What's growing across Canada right now? I can tell you academies are growing. BC, I was just out there presenting, in BC, you know what they're upset with? Their midget teams can't get enough to put a triple-A midget team in the ice because the good players are all gone to the academies and now they're back at the double-A level. Why do they go to academies? I can tell you. They think better teaching, better coaching, better environment. Female hockey is growing right across the country. You've just had a great presentation. You would not believe the non-sanctioned programs in Ontario and don't think it isn't gonna happen in other places. 22 junior teams that are all made up of players that can't play high school hockey, not good enough to play junior C, and their fathers have started a league so that they can play junior hockey, not affiliated with Hockey Canada, not affiliated with Ontario OHF. Year-round program, and we can't stop that. High school hockey. I just came back from Newfoundland after I went to Vancouver. They asked me to sit down and talk to them because their midgets can play both high school and play midget hockey. And what happens? Every weekend there's a high school hockey tournament, they're gone and they say, screw the midgets. And the midgets are upset because they can't run a quality program. High school hockey is booming, just like you saw from Minnesota in the, in the Atlantic provinces. Because why? Peer pressure. Okay, friends, etc. You go to a midget game and you're looking at, lucky if mom and dad are there in order to see the game. Certified coaches. We got more certified coaches in high performance right now in Canada than we've ever had. Cost of the game is increasing and you've just been through an awful lot of changes of initiation program growing. I want to tell you today that I want to, to come up with a, a thesis that I think will help you. I want to know what the perfect coach is. If you know what the perfect coach is, you're ahead of me. But I want to know what the perfect coach is. I want to know if it's a myth or a reality. Because if the perfect coach is a myth, the Toronto Maple Leafs have just blown $60 million, okay? 
they are up the river without a paddle, okay? And they won't know what to do. If it's reality, I can tell you we are going to be celebrating in Toronto before you are, because we are going to have a Stanley Cup in Toronto in the next five years. I guarantee you, if it's a reality, that he's a perfect coach. A myth is fictitious. Reality is a fact. Here's what a perfect person looks like. Utter, excellent, accurate. The bottom one is what we're looking at with hockey. Conforming absolutely to the ideal type. What is the perfect coach in hockey? What does he or she look like? Can you describe them? My belief is that the perfect coach, coaches have the best potential to make our game great for every participant, from the beginner to the professional, and make the game grow, grow, grow. Why am I coaching four, five, and six-year-old girls? because I think I can have a great impact on the instructors helping me, and I can have a great impact on those girls. I hate to tell you, last year, being an educator for 34 years, I took my granddaughter, four years old, out of school, twice a week, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I took her skating and with a hockey stick in her hand at Mothers and Tots. My wife, my, her mother's a teacher in the school, her father's a teacher, my wife was a teacher. How could you as an educator take her out of junior kindergarten? Kindergarten teacher said, I wish you'd take the whole damn class. <laughs> I said, I'd love to take the whole damn class, but you know what, you have to have helmets. You, have, you have, can't have helmets that somebody else wore because you might get lice. You have to have all the this safety issues that we have to deal with with regards to busing, etc. But I can take my granddaughter out because when I was a leader of education, physical education in Waterloo County, we had 120 schools and we had 110 outdoor rinks. And kids skated without a helmet and they learned to skate and that's why we had so many kids playing hockey because they learned to skate when they're in school. School was a, a factory in order to produce them. Do you know the left is Maple Leaf Gardens 45, 50 years ago? The right is the Air Canada Centre. Do you know that Air Canada Centre is growing hockey in Ontario? 4,000 more people are going to all the Leaf games than before. It attracts and promotes hockey. I want you to understand this one philosopher's statement. To understand where we need to go, we need to understand where we have been. That is what we're going to look at right now. I'm going to take you through four generations quickly of hockey, and I'm going to show you how we grew in those four, four uh, generations. There were a lot of hiccups in there, but if we can learn something from that four generations, maybe we are going to be able to make this game grow in the, ge in the decade that we're in right now. I should say four decades instead of four generations. I apologize. The Summit Series in 1972. Stand up in this room. If you were playing hockey in 1972, stand up. Right now, if you play hockey in 1972, stand up. The reason I ask these people to stand up is when you're their age, usually you get a little stiff if you sit too long, too long. And I, I, ju I just wanted to make sure they got a little exercise program in, okay, in that situation. If you notice, there was only about 10 or 15 of them. So I'll bet you there's a pile of you in here that weren't even born, okay, and there's another pile of you that are most likely babies. The, the team, or the Canadian hockey leadership said, let's take our best NHL players, because they can't play in the Olympics, and let's play against the best Russians in 72, because the Russians were dominating the Olympics. And we wanted to say, we were the number one country in hockey in the world. That's what we wanted to say. And we believed we were, and we had been saying that all along. Well, it led to the goal of the century. Here, at the end of 27 astounding days, there is time for one more moment to define the heart and character of Canadian hockey. Canadian team went into a hot player, which seemed to be a little unusual. 102 left in the game. Maple done, he cleared to the open way to Cornwallier. Cornwallier took a shot, the defenseman fell over. The after the Cornwallier has it on that way. Here's the shot! Henderson made a wild stab for Spell. Here's another shot!
As everyone is overcome by emotion, there is a realization. Forgettable moment. You realize that team was booed in Vancouver when they left the ice, when they had lost the game in Vancouver, which put them down before they went to Russia for their four games? Esposito gave the great speeches about how he was disappointed in the Canadian fans. You didn't see anything at the end but inspiration. I can remember being in a school, we had one TV, one TV in 72, and we brought all the kids into the gymnasium to watch the game. If you can imagine how important it was and how it inspired us in order to want to play the game of hockey because we were the greatest. I paid my dues time after time. We played that. We believed that. Harry Sinnon was a coach. Was he a perfect coach? Should we have modeled after everything after Harry Sinnon? He won an NHL, uh, uh, won a uh, Stanley Cup. Do you know that after he came back from winning that, he couldn't hold a job. He couldn't hold a job any longer in two months in coaching, but he did become a, the general manager of the Boston Bruins. Here's what happened in the 70s. We panicked. We thought the Russians were better than us. We panicked because they were big in coaching education. If you haven't read Tarasov's book, you don't know what the Russians were doing. He wrote their recipe of why they won all the Olympic games in, 19, in the 1960s and the 70s. Why did we win? Here's what the Russians did. Here's what we were dealing with. Lloyd Percival, 1951. That was our coaching manual at that time. This book, it was updated to look like this in 1992 by his son. We were in trouble. We were in trouble. Canadian hockey had no leadership to write things in the, fr in the front office. They had no leadership to know where we should be going. Where were they going to get a turn? I can tell you where they turned. They turned to universities and teachers throughout the hockey world and asked these people to join them in a force in order to change Canadian hockey and write curriculum. They were experts in physiology and biomechanics. They were experts in motor skill teaching. They were experts in mental prep. They were ex excellent in all areas. They came together and they became the writers. And this is where we really got our thrust with regards to education. I can remember sitting in holiday inns in Kitchener and Toronto with three or four of these guys writing and we would sneak off work in order to be able to, from our jobs, in order to do this. Most of those guys were coaching at the university at that time. Here's what we attacked in the 70s. Fundamental hockey programs. You ever heard the name Pat Doherty? Pat Doherty, okay, wrote a program on fundamental hockey school. It's the basis of what you see in your initiation program. You ever see Call Me Coach? A video called Call Me Coach. It was 30 minutes long, and after that you did an on-ice practice and you did one hour discussion. That was your house league program. And then came the intermediate and advanced competitive programs that we learned to do. But don't forget this. In the 70s, we won six Stanley Cups in Canada. And that was one of our drives, six Stanley Cups. Dave Chambers decided that he would describe for us what a perfect coach is in the 70s. 19 different things there. Communicator, ability to teach, concern about the athlete, knowledge of the games, and so on. That's what the perfect coach was starting to look like. The th second thing that made the game grow because the Stanley Cups and because of education was hockey schools boomed in the 70s. Boomed. I started a hockey school in Kitchener in 73, nonprofit with Pat Doherty. We had one ice surface, two weeks. Within 10 years, we were three ice surfaces. We went from eight to 10 at night, okay? And uh, we had uh, a situation that we were in, uh, averaging over 1,400 players in six weeks program. That is what was driving the game. Parents could bring their kids, they could get skills, and then they could see, see them develop and put them into programs. There used to be a great hockey school in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. It was run by Scotty Bowman. And Scotty Bowman used to take all his Montreal greats, Doug Harvey, etc., down there. They would put on a hockey school in St. Andrews. It attracted everybody from Boston and Massachusetts, okay, to come to the program. 
It was in the middle of the 70s that they died. The program died under their leadership, and it went to University of New Brunswick. Two, week, two years later, the hockey school ceased to happen. Didn't get the names. They asked me in 1979, would I go down and start a hockey school in St. Andrews, New Brunswick with Gus Bodner and build the hockey school. I said, you get me the hockey players, I will get you the teachers, and we will build you a hockey school. Those were the names of the hockey players they got me the first year. Not a bad group of guys. Not a bad group. If you look at it now, okay, and the salaries they get today, we'd most likely have, okay, a few uh, hundred million dollars, okay, sitting there with those guys. I can tell you an interesting story. Gump Worsley, I took him out and I said, Gump, I want you to do this drill, okay, for players, for the goalies. I want you to turn the net around, take this bucket of tennis balls I have, and put the goalie in so the ball comes off the glass and they have to react to it. Work on reaction time, throw them, boom, boom, boom. He said, oh, no problem, okay, I'll do that. I've never seen that before, I'll do it. About a half an hour later, Kevin Lowe came down to me and he says, Coach, you gotta do something. I said, why? He says, Gump hasn't got out of the net yet. He <laughs> says, the kids are throwing the balls and he's having fun, okay? <laughs> Just stopping the balls, okay? He was a greyhound drinker. He drank uh, grapefruit juice and vodka, okay, the night before, and I th think maybe he was trying to wear some of it out. Secondly, I gotta tell you, Wayne Gretzky was raised, okay, about 20, 20 miles away from uh, Kitchener and Brantford. And Wayne Gretzky was always considered that he was born with an awful lot of talent, hockey player, talent. Wayne Gretzky was the hardest working hockey player in his time. He worked for everything he got. When he was working, I always took him on the seven to 10 shift at night. He liked to golf. And go golfing the day, he and I'd have the seven to 10 shift at night. After we finished at 10 o'clock, he said, coach, stay on the ice. Bucket of pucks, bucket of pucks. He'd stand in front of the net. He made me fire them across the, the, the goal line, and he'd pick them out of the air and tip them in. One hour, we did it, Monday to Friday, one hour. The next week and the second week of school, he picked a different activity that he wanted to do with skating afterwards and work. That was his attitude as an 18 and 19 year old that put him, okay, into the status he's in. Hockey school's boom. <laughs>
to be excellent to get started, you have to get started to be excellent. This summer, I was visiting in Brandon. I went up to Rivers and I saw an excellent hockey school. An excellent hockey school. And I honestly believe that it would be growing, okay, players' interests in that community. There were 114, 115 players registered in the program, it was under the supervision of Derek Laxtell, and uh, Derek and I are close friends, and I wanted to see how it was operated, but I think it's going to be something, and I highly encouraged them. I said, I think you can sell a two-week hockey school here in this community and uh, fill it with those numbers. In the 1980s, everything changed to excellence. Excellence was a word. Okay, excellence driven from the top down. It was driven by Canadian hockey that we would have excellence. Under 17 teams, under 18 teams, national junior teams, men's national team, women's national team. Focus on international success from excellence in coaching. And you know what? In the 80s, we won six Stanley Cups. Six. So we're still booming and getting lots of support with the Stanley Cup presentation. We, we needed to get it, continue to get it with regards to international. I remember coaching Ontario's first under-17 team in the first tournament was held in Quebec, okay, in Montreal in 1985. I can remember having my camp, okay, with the camp for the team, okay, in Waterloo, because I was started there as a university coach th that year, and uh, said, well, we've got a facility here, we'll have it here in the summertime. Two of the players, I know the names, Fogarty and Marchman, okay, Fogarty first round pick, Marchman was picked fourth overall in the league, Okay, knocked a guy off his bicycle, was a university student, and stole 24 beer from him. Took them back to his room, took them back to the room. Next thing I have the campus police there. They want to lay charges, da-da-da-da. What am I going to do? First time we've ever had an under-17 program. Am I going to hit this, the newspaper, with this story? The first round draft pick, okay, in the OHL, and the fourth round draft pick out because they were drinking and because he had knocked a guy off his bicycle. No. What I did is I sent one coach to the room, go get the beer, take it away, convince the campus police to do us a flavor and let it go. Best lesson I ever learned was never do it again. We went to the championship, we went to the play in, in Quebec to play in the tournament, okay? One of our assistant coaches had to room with Fogarty. That was a deal. The other assistant coach had to room, okay, with Marchment. Wouldn't get away with that today, but we were able to get away with it in 85. A coach rooming with a player. What do we do? Co coach goes up to his room, Fogarty's dad sitting on the bed with his son drinking a six pack, okay, together, okay, in the middle of an afternoon when we played that night. What did we do? We sent Fogarty and his dad home. Fogarty played one game. What about Marchman? Marchman was upset that we sent Fogarty home. Marchman went out and hit a Russian over the head with a stick got suspended for the rest of the tournament. We sent Marchman and his dad home. What did I learn? It was my fault that I didn't deal with the first time in the first place, and they never had the, part, uh, the right to participate in it. Here's what happened in 87. In 87, the world was catching up to us again, and Canada wanted to make sure that they were filled, they were still out in the Olympics, that they were the best hockey club. So there was nothing to brag about in Canada from back in the 72 series to now. And in the 87 series, okay, they ended up playing round robin with those teams, two, two divisions, and they ended up playing Russia. And this was the second greatest goal of that uh, yeah, century. You know what? I paid my dues. <laughs> time after we played time. this. We played this for a month. We played it in our dressing rooms. Okay, we wanted our players to know but we are the best in the world. And then we described the perfect coach. 
in the 89 when Manning went out and he took 253 coaches and he asked them what qualities a coach had to be to be perfect. What were the things that stood out in the best coaches? The results came back of those five areas. A communicator, a leader, a motivator, a teacher, and technical knowledge, and you had to excel in all of them. So if we're starting to look for a per perfect coach, you'll see why a lot have been successful who have come out of the universities. Here's what happened in the 80s. We won the Canada Cup. University coaches were labeled as perfect coaches. They were given the, U the NHL door wide open to them. The coach at Waterloo won one game in 1983, won two games in 1984, and in 1985 was an assistant coach with the New York Rangers. Not bad, okay, when you can win one game one year and two the next year and that. That is why I got the job at the University of Waterloo. He left late, they needed a coach, and uh, I was stepped in there. Keenan, Prawn, and Watt were all university, former university coaches, and they coached King Canada in 87. You're in hockey school, which is just outside of London, brought in hundreds of prof professional players and ran a camp for them in August, and they said they had never had an experience like it in their life, okay, as being trained that hard in August to go to camp because usually they never trained until they went to their professional camp. They went back and told their owners, and that's why the door opened for NHL, the NHL for university coaches, because every coach at your hockey school was a university coach. And last, we got leaders, at the, they were leaders in teaching and advanced coaching certification. Well, then come the 90s. Some of you are now very active. Not good. Harassment, abuse, bullying, drugs. I spent four years with the Red Cross doing Speak Out. At that time, I was coaching chair with Hockey Canada. A lot of work going into dealing with what we were doing. The 90s. Not good. Training programs, still looking them for perfect coaches. We weren't winning internationally. And you know, they got one Stanley Cup in the 90s. One. We've gone from seven. We've gone from six. We've gone to one. Here's what the 90s look like. CHL coaches all bought in to high performance. At that time, it was called advanced coaching certification. They bought in and they took it. That's where Mike Babcock got to start in coaching cert certification. When he became a junior coach, communicator, excellence in level four certification. We believe that we should have a level four. That's what soccer had. That's what other sports had. We didn't have one. They said, write a level four pro program. So I accepted the rule of I'd write a level four program, and I had an assistant coach at Waterloo named Jeff Ward. Brilliant kid. Brilliant. He's now assistant, uh, assistant coach with New Jersey Devils. He told me after three years of coaching with me, he says, I'm on my way to the NHL. I said, I hope I have something to contribute to it. But do you know what? He was right. He was going to the NHL. School teacher, hated teaching, wanted to coach. We had to prove it to the CAC. We wrote the program, went down, presented it to the CAC. Jeff was weak in two areas. They said, go back, and he's got to get better in those two areas. Go back three months later, and that's how we got a level four program. Anybody in here have a level four program? That's what you get when you get a level four. <coughs> a gold whistle. Everybody got a gold whistle. We gave out 30 of them in Saskatoon and at an advanced two okay, seminar in the, in the 90s. Do you know what? I don't think we've given one out since this year 2000. Change in leadership in, in, in Hockey Canada, less emphasis on the top end, more emphasis possibly in other areas. Junior, juniors were hot in the 90s. They won seven gold medals in World Junior. Females needed coach leaders, and you know ethics become a huge thing. I want to tell you that when we looked at those five areas, communicator, teacher, leader, motivator, and technical knowledge, we found that the weakest gap was in two areas, teaching and leading. Teaching and leading. Why? Because they didn't know how to teach and never had experience, and leading is because ethical issues were still an issue, a real big issue, a real big issue. This is what excellence in teaching is, the amount of learning. That is how you measure excellence. In hockey, you don't win hockey games, okay, by how much the coach knows. You win hockey games, but how, how much the players have learned. 
Once you recognize that skills are repeatable things, just like if I asked you, ma'am, what's eight times eight? She said 64, just like that. That is a skill, a positive mental skill that she required. What is 12 times 14? Her reaction time is much lo longer because she has not repeat, repeated that skill. So what we're d sh demonstrating is that the repetition of motor skills, perceptual motor skills. Don't forget this, that every skill in hockey that we teach from the youngest kid initiation program to the oldest is a perceptual motor skill and everything that we do starts in the brain. The brain tells you what to do and it moves from the brain down until you finally make a decision and you make an action. There's the pathway, perception, decision, action. You will hear what reaction time is. Reaction time is shortening the time to go from perception to action. And you do that by repeating it so many times that it gets into your long-term memory. That's why you write out the timetables. That's why you repeat the timetables in order to demonstrate it. That's why you do certain things in the game of hockey. Repetition, 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 repetition. Don't if they over think you can overplay it. You can't. Specificity. Specificity is what you are doing, okay, when you take your initiation program and go to half ice. You are making the game, okay, where more perceptual motor skills will be involved in the game. They will be involved in developing reaction time. I want you to remember this one quote. What is execution? Execution is repetition is the mother of learning and the father of action which makes the architect of accomplishment. Look at this example. No Patrice Bergeron tonight, so Tyler Sagan remains in their lineup. In comes Tyler Sagan. Remember what draft pick Sagan was? Number two, Taylor Hall ahead of him. Do you know what his big promotion was all through his, his uh, draft year? Taylor Hall lived north of Barry, outside of Aurelia. Black flies were terrible. Unbelievable at the summertime. His dad built him a mask, which goes over his face with cloth on it so that they could not interfere with his shooting. He shot pucks all summer long, never stopped right up until the time he left, okay, the draft and went to Boston. Did you see what he did in that video? He scored on his backhand up high. He scored on his forehand up high. Within two minutes in the same game, the only information he had before going in from the scouting report, shoot high on the goaltender. Execution like that is great. I always ask coaches when I do the HB1, how many of you have ever set 25 pucks across the top of a goal crease for every one of your forwards and told them to jack 25 pucks up under the crossbar, okay, as a drill in, the, in, a, in a practice. And most of them will say, no, we never get time in order to do that. And they wonder why a player can't pick up a puck off a bad pa a back pad stop by a goaltender and jack it up in the top corner. But players can if they want to practice it off ice by themselves. You know what happened in the 1990s? The Dubin Commission came out and it was reporting on Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson won the, the 100 meter, okay, got the gold medal. The next day they took the gold medal away, failed the drug test. And what that happened is that created this, this statement from the youngest peewee player to the elite athlete, the coach is a pivotal character in moral as well as physical development of his and her charges. That put a lot of pressure on you. You are fortunate indeed if your coach is concerned with moral and intellectual development as well as athletic training. Theron Fleury was never supposed to make it in the NHL. At 5'6 and 145 pounds, he was too small to play in a game of Giants. Because I was as small as I was, people would you know, always say, forget it, there's no chance he'll ever make it. But no one knew the size of his heart. He put up Hall of Fame numbers, 455 goals, more than 1,000 points. He won a Stanley Cup a world championship, and an Olympic gold medal. His journey took him from Calgary to Colorado, New York, Chicago. But there was another side to the story. 
Fleury made $50 million playing hockey and lost it all. Drugs, alcohol, strippers, gambling, ex-wives, it adds up. I tried to uh, take a bite out of the Big Apple, but it, uh, it took a very large one out of me. Donald Trump's helicopter would pick him up after games, take him to a casino where he gambled and partied all night, then take him back to New York in time for practice. Nobody knew. Every hockey player has one or two stories, but Theo has dozens and dozens. Funny, crazy, tragic, incredible. I mean, it's amazing he's still alive. It's all in the book. Uh, no stone left unturned. He's come through it all, clean and sober, in great shape, trying to make the most improbable comeback in sports. I think it's the most intriguing and entertaining sports story ever. The truth about my life will finally be told. Playing with fire. A hockey book unlike any other. Playing with, Playing with Fire is one book. There's 10 of them out there if you want to read. With re talks about the problems with regards to playing the game at the professional level at that time. In 1998 Olympics, look at We won a bronze medal with gentlemen. We won a silver medal okay, with ladies. And that was the first time the ladies were ever in it. And it was the first time the men were ever with professional players in the Olympics. A bad decade, a bad decade. We had to focus on too many, too many negative things. The one positive thing that came out was the impact of the girls playing in the Olympics. Look at the growth between 98 and 99, 30% increase in the growth of, of girls hockey because of it, them being in the Olympics, the exposure. You've just heard a presentation on exposure. Why are they traveling across this country to generate energy for girls hockey? To generate it and at the highest level, when we perform at the highest level and we share it with everybody across this country, then the energy starts and it trickles down. Hockey Canada struggles right now. They don't know whether they should be at from growing from the bottom up or the top down. Now they're in the big end of the initiation program. Another time they'll be bo big at pushing, okay, at the top end. Solutions of a new century. You are in a new century right now. Coach education, leadership and role models, parent education, recruitment, safety, screening. We still want international success. And are we ever dry for Stanley Cups? We are really, really pa passionate to try to get a Stanley Cup. A guy named Joe Erfman reminds you that don't ever focus, lose the focus, that hockey should be about win kids with sports, not win sports with kids. If you do the first one well, the second one will happen. Win kids with sports. Here's what 202 did for us. It gave us an Olympic medal in gold and gold. Boom, boom. Oh, yeah. I paid my dues. We were back. We were back. We were singing Time again. We were happy. Die. We were really happy. And then we went to the 206 Olympics, and look at no gold for the men, not even a medal, never finished it. We're using NHL players, and the women save us. They win gold. Been the story of our life. Women will save us. Made there. Back ahead now comes Sidney Crosby. Crosby tries to dance through. Miller guides it away to the corner. Crosby up with it there. Punched along to Jerome McGinley. Crosby scores! It's over! The gold medal to Canada! Crosby saved us. He saved that first 10 years. It's gold of the century right now. Will it continue to be? I'm sure that we're going to outshine that one sometime. But here you are right now. Here you are, 211 to 220. Okay, the decade that you're living in, the decade that you're providing leadership. Excellence from above questioned. Our under-17 teams went from five to three because we weren't winning. Felt we weren't good enough with five, we need to go to three. That's talking about you and I and our skill development that we're doing with these kids across the country. Ethics questioned. I can tell you that when I go across the country and speak, I tell every single coach, I cannot tolerate walking into rinks and hearing an F-bomb. I can go into every school and speak in every school and never hear an F-bomb. And I can go into every rink in Canada 
and people will believe that it's okay to use F-bombs in dressing rooms. I'm telling you, we are going to get rid of it. We are going to get rid of it out of our game. We all are going to work at it. I promised my four-year-old granddaughter when she got into the rank that I'd make sure that it wasn't there. School academies are growing. No Stanley Cups in 25 years. What would it do for Winnipeg to win a Stanley Cup for hockey in Manitoba? When they say if the Leafs won, my son said it would be the biggest growth of hockey in the whole province of Toronto. That if we did everything made hockey free, we'd still do better if the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. I'm sure it would be a great impact here. Junior hockey is exploding in the USA. I coached in, in Texas for nine years. Do you know what? Nine years in Texas, pro hockey, there's 17 teams, not one of them with the pro team is gone. Do you know what they all have now? Junior teams. Junior teams are exploding. The Americans of the CHL scare me today. How many Americans do you think were on the Memorial Cup team this year? You heard Minnesota's presentation. How many of them are on the Memorial Cup winning team? Seven. Windsor had seven Americans on the team. Portland had 13. The average, okay, in the, CH, in the OHL is three. You go down east and it's two. You go out west, out here west, it's between two and three. Average with one but 13. The poor teams don't have them. The rich teams have them. I'll tell you why the rich teams have them. I want a scholarship, guarantee of $250,000 if I'm an American and come up here and play. Because I'm gonna go to Harvard or I'm gonna to go to Cornell, and that's where I'm gonna go because I'm playing four years of junior or three years of junior with you. Kitchener affords it, London affords it, Windsor affords it. They afford that because they wanna get those premier players because they believe that they'll never go to school or they'll go to their pro career. Under 20s are very inconsistent. Cost of the game's up, coach education is a needed priority, parent education is a needed priority. In 210, we started the HP1. I finished my time at Thunder Bay, came back, Hockey Canada said, would you come and co-host or co-chair the new program to write a new HP1 program? And I've been at that ever since. Then the last nine years working on the HP1 program. Lastly, safety concussions and fighting in the game. They're all there. Babcock has helped us. Babcock has helped us because we honestly can profile a guy who has done everything that we wanted a perfect coach to do in our programs and taking the level four program and he was successful on back-to-back -back Olympic situations. We've got the initiation program going now, gang. It's going to be great. I can't wait to see my girls next week. There's a new curriculum for the perfect coach if you're an HB1. Boy. It's heavy. Do you know what it is? 40 hour seminar. After 40 hour seminar, 40 hour examination, written assignment, do it. And then your field evaluations, a practice, a game, and a program review. And that takes three good uh, interactions with the, with the evaluator. It's good because I can tell you what, that's what I'm seeing after eight years of the HP1. I'm seeing better coaches in Ontario. I'm seeing them better knowledge, better prepared. I see our players still, okay, the McDavid's, et cetera, the best in the CHL when they're coming through. CIS hockey has gone a notch up. If you see school and see men's CIS hockey, I'll tell you, I spent 13, 15 years coaching there, and it has gone up. It is great because they're getting more players coming out of the, the Canadian Junior Hockey League into that program. Less coach suspensions. The big thing is we are weeding out weak coaches. We are getting rid of bad coaches. We're not letting them be head coaches if they can't do it. We're getting betting role models and coaches are getting career opportunities. I was surprised the other day when I saw the hands when people ask you, are you volunteers and that in the room? And surprised and I admire that situation. And I heard the gentleman talking about Toronto situation, et cetera. And it's a different world and it's a world that's not to change, but you can get forty, fifty thousand dollars to coach a triple A Pee Wee team or an Adam team in Toronto quite easy if you have the uh, skills and the qualifications in order to do it. The compensation has gone up and that is going because you have to take more training in order to do it and be more qualified in that situation. I want to leave you with 10 essentials as an administrator that I want you to think about perfect coach. 10 essentials and I want you to ask these questions, okay? Uh, 
of the coaches when you're interviewing. Don't write them down. You'll get those from, these from Peter. And uh, the first one is, why are you coaching? If a coach can't answer that question other than say, I love the game, I love playing the game, I love kids, da-da-da-da, he has to have an intent, he has to have a content, he has to know why he wants to coach. He wants to help people become better, he has to have a commitment for it. Second is, you've heard vision all weekend. What's your vision? What are you aiming at? What are the positive results you want? Is your heart in your coaching? This is the best example I can give you. Great moments are born from great opportunities. That's what you have here tonight, boys. That's what you earned here tonight. One game. If we play them ten times, they might win nine. But not this game. Not tonight. Tonight, we skate with them. Tonight, we stay with them. And we shut them down because we can. Tonight, we are the greatest hockey team in the world. We were born to be hockey players. Every one of you. And you were meant to be here tonight. This is your time. Their time is done. It's over. I'm sick and tired hearing about what a great hockey team the Soviets have. Screw them. This is your time. Now go out there and take it. F bombs run inseparable. Screw it is okay. Okay. <laughs> Lead with attention. Analytics. Okay, lead, you have to be able to deal with data. You have to be able to do, deal with a baseline assessment. What are the, the facts about it? Lead with integrity. Why we say lead with integrity? Team building requires trust, and trust comes from integrity. Discipline. Do you have the goals to be measured? You have to have something to be measured. Can you give more? I'm sure we all. Man knows that by helping someone else, he is actually helping himself. Are you a perfect coach? Do you practice what you preach? And do you preach what you practice? Do you lead with grace? Or do you bow to pressure? Hopefully you lead with grace. Are you an example for your team? And last, how do you ensure that you remain positive, attracting positive energy into your solutions? Administrators, the whole work of a well-managed branch is not the absence of problems, but it's the ability to solve those problems, to resolve those problems. I want you to focus on this one last video to give you a perception of your role.
You have no choice. You are a leader. What you do have a choice of is what kind of a leader you're going to be. Walk the talk is the biggest challenge that we all face every day. Can we walk what we believe? Here is what I'm going to recommend you as administrators. The challenge is resolved through leadership. Recruit good people to coach. That's most important. Nobody is happier than the parent when the player comes home and says, I love my coach. I listen to my coach more than I listen to mom and dad. Train all of your coaches at all levels. Funding the, of those training. Have branch, man, have branch mentors. Have association mentors. That's what we need, continuous education. Fundamental program leaders paid the same as junior coaches. Wouldn't that be something special? That's what they do in Sweden. They pay the people who work with the four, five, six-year-olds more than the junior coaches. Support the program of excellence. Creating the perfect coach, that's your job. That's your job. I've told you what the perfect coach looks like. You're going to, okay, look after it now. You're going to water it. Your responsibility is to go hard after Hockey Canada to give you the best programs that develop knowledge, skills, and attitudes to build those perfect coaches. You've got to do that. When you sit around that table, you demand that coming out of them. I think today I can prove that there is no myth about perfect coaches. We have perfect coaches. We have them at all levels throughout hockey, ho our hockey world in Canada. But it's our mandate, because that's our mandate as administrators, to get those. That's your mandate. Reality is, though, we need more perfect coaches. And you get the opportunity to start in the tiebreaker. A 10. I'm going to change the card, please. Changing the 10 to a oh, 5. Higher. Higher than the 5. A 6. Higher. If it's higher, we have a new champion. And higher. 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 $1,800 in cash, Gina. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You too. And good luck with the babies. You thank want to have you. four, right? I want four. four. I think right. Gina Shaw. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. And Don, come on down here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. And Don McKee, our new champion, will go for the big money. But first, we're going to take time out for a commercial break. Way to go. Thank you. Back with our champion and Don. We've already played the money cards once, so we dealt them out in front of our studio audience after you cut them, yes? Yes, sir. Then here we go. Here's $200, Don. Thank good you. Good luck. And we'll see if we can start you off with a good base card. $200, and Don has a queen. That's good. I'm going to go 150 lower. Good size bet, $150 lower than the queen. He's right. Good. I'm going to go a little bit higher. Trying to double it for $700 higher. Let's yes, for the five. I will go $200 higher. $200, higher than a five. He's right again. $900 on the bottom line. Up goes the 10 with the other 200. You have 1,100, Don. I'll change the card, please, Jim. Changing the 10 to a four. Good, good change. Five. Good cut. I will go 500 higher. 500, higher than a four. Right. I will go 200 lower. 200 lower than a 10. And he's right again for 1,800. I will go 400 higher. 400, higher than a five. Right again. Nicely done with really not such good cards. We're going to move up to nine. Do you want it done? I'll change it, Jim, please. Come on, let's see a goodie, because you've got good money for the big bet. The nine becomes, oh, a nine. Don, you must bet at least 1,100. You have 2,200. You're near the middle with a nine. What's your big bet? I will go half of it lower. Well, you're going to come out of it with pretty good money. Come on, let's come out with over 3,000. Half of it, lower than a nine. Oh. oh. <laughs> I want you to go home, and whoever you see when you get home tight, if they ask who is speaking, some say some dark-haired guy about 30 years old, <laughs> okay, who needed a haircut. I was on a sabbatical. Like I didn't have any money at all. My family and I were living in California with our sister-in-law, and I couldn't afford a haircut. But I did get on the game show and uh, while I was there. So um, you just remember, thanks for being a great audience. I really appreciated being with you. Thank you.